صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك وعلى أهل بيتك المظلومين صلى الله عليك يا مولاي وابن مولاي يا أبا عبد الله الحسين وعلى ابنك المظلوم المقهور المعذب بقعر السجون الإمام التقي النقي الزكي كاظم الغائب الإمام الذي اختاره الله الإمام الذي اختاره الله لخلقه حجة عليهم الإمام موسى بن جعفر السلام عليك يا مولاي ورحمة الله وبركاته Peace and blessings be upon you, Ya Rasulallah Peace and blessings be upon you Ya Aba Abdullah Al-Husayn And on your son, the oppressed Imam the one who was in prison for many long years, the Imam who was known for his worship, for his purity, for his sanctity, for his sincerity. Imam Musa ibn Jafar, peace and blessings on you all, all my masters. Warahmatullahi wa barakatuh. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billahi al-ali al-azim. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. The first of our love is salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad for the love of Imam Musa al-Kazim. Allahumma salli ala. The next one for the love of Amir al Mu'mineen alayhi salam Allah. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala Muhammad. And the last one for the Imam of the time, Sahib al Asr wa Zaman, in your loudest voices. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa ajil farajahum wa ala Abu Bakr. I want to begin, my brothers and sisters, by sending my condolences to none other than Sahib al Asr wa Zaman on the death anniversary of. His beloved father, Imam Musa al kazim alayhi salam Allah. The Imam that was imprisoned for many, many years, some say 13 years. The Imam that was moved from prison to prison because even when he was chained, he was a threat. The Imam that did not use weapons, did not use an army, did not use men in physical strength to spread the message of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad, or to threaten those that sat on the chairs and sat on the thrones, to threaten the kingdom of Harun al-Rashid. Rather, it was through his sajda. It was through his rosary, his masbaha. It was through his dua. Did he not conquer all of the kingdoms? Rather, rather, he conquered the entire world. He imprisoned the entire world through what he taught through his actions, through his words, how he used to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the nights and pray to God for the safety of his family, his Shia, and the destruction of Harun and his likes. And subhanAllah, today, where is the grave of Harun? And where is the grave of Musa ibn Jafar? 
Sheikh al Wa'ili says it the best. He says, he says, you lived in a prison cell so dark and gloomy, but today your palace shines through the streets of Baghdad and can be seen from the skies and the kingdom, the palace of Harun al Rashid today. Nobody knows of it. But before, it was what was shining. And look what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did. And look at the poetic justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we want to sit, my brothers and sisters, and speak about this Imam, analyze this Imam, try to understand this Imam, trust me. Trust me. Someone low like myself cannot do justice to Imam Musa ibn Ja'far alayhi salamullah. Nor can all the books in this library or all the books in the world describe to you who Musa ibn Ja'far was and the challenges that he went through to give you what you have today and the identity that you have today, my brothers and sisters. But in these next 20 or so minutes, we want to try and analyze a piece of his life from the books, from the ahadith, from what was given to us by Ahlul Bayt alayhim salamullah. And inshallah, in the next 20 or 30 minutes, we want to see how the events that took place in the life of Musa ibn Jafar alayhi salam, how can it connect to us? And not all of the events, because as we said, if we want to talk about all of the events, one lecture would not suffice. But some of the events that led up to, number one, Imam Musa ibn Jafar alayhi salam becoming the Imam or taking on the responsibilities of the Imam, he was always the Imam, but taking on the responsibilities of the Imam uh, of Imam uh, of, of the Imamate itself after Imam Jafar Sadiq alayhi salam and some of the other challenges that Imam al Kazim alayhi salam faced at the end of his life and the challenges that the Shias may Allah bless them all faced at the end of the life of Imam Musa al Kazim alayhi salam because why do I want to focus on these two um, aspects of the Imam's life is because when we talk about Imam Musa al Kazim a lot of us think of when he was in prison. When we say the challenges of Musa al-Kadhim alayhi salam, many of us think of when he was imprisoned in the cells of Harun al-Rashid. Fact of the matter is, my brothers and sisters, the challenges of Imam Musa al-Kadhim alayhi salam's imamate did not start when he was taken from Medina to Baghdad or to Basra. No. The challenges of the Imam alayhi salam began right when he took on imamate itself. As in the Imamah of Musa ibn Jafar salam, was extremely, extremely crucial, extremely crucial to the future of the Shias. And many people at that time, many Shias at that time went astray because of the different challenges and tests and trials that were being, being put forth and they were more or less facing the Shias at that time. And you're going to see that many different Shia sects and groups emerged at the time of Imam Musa al kazim alayhi salam. Two of them, most notably being al Ismailiyah, which is the second largest Shia group today, and, which, and they're very strong and they're very prominent today, although not much, but they're prominent and they're there. Number one. Number two, al Waqifa, which there aren't many left of them, if any at all, but they were very strong financially, politically, and had a lot of influence at the time of Imam al Rida alayhi salam, and they emerged right after the death of. Imam Musa al Kadhim, and we'll hear about them insha'Allah in tonight's lecture. We're going to look at these two challenges, my brothers and sisters, focus on them and extract something from these two challenges for ourselves, my brothers and sisters, today in this day and age, insha'Allah ta'ala. With your permission, we will begin with the bahath, with the discussion with the loud salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. The second one for the love of Imam Musa al Kadhim alayhi salam. Before we begin, my brothers and sisters, I want to point to an idea, or a, a point. I want to point to something, um, more or less the method that we're going to uh, be using for the next set of lectures, inshallah ta'ala. Um, astaghfirullah in saying the words, Anna, I'm, I'm a nobody, I am nothing. But my personal way of lecturing or, when, or, or a method that I like to adopt is to read right from the sources themselves, read right from the books themselves. Sadly, I feel um, this is not being done anymore. 
and the content of our lectures in today's day and age, especially the English lectures, my brothers and sisters, is not at the point that it should be. The quality itself is not at the point that it should be. One of the reasons in my astaghfirullah personal belief is because we're not reading from the sources anymore, right? We, we are giving a very quick overview of a hadith. We're not reading them from the sources. We're not telling the people, hey, this is found in this book or in that book. And just generally speaking, I find a lot of the times the hadith that are being uh, given um, and, and, and being um, sort of presented to the people are off the top of the speaker's head, which is great. But the barakah itself, the blessing is in the hadith itself. So the book that we're going to be using f for the most part is this book called Usul Al-Kafi. It's not the entire uh, book of Al-Kafi, but it's a book that pretty much brings um, many of the ahadith of Al-Kafi and more or less summarizes Al-Kafi in, in, in many hadith. So many of the repeated hadiths are not in here. Um, and it gives a good overview. And if anybody can read Arabic, it's a very good book. And inshallah, hopefully we have time. The other book that we're going to be referring to is the book called uh, Imam Al-Jawad alayhi salam min al-Mahdi ila al-Lahad. You're telling me, well, we're talking about Imam Al-Kadhim alayhi salam. What brought Imam Al-Jawad into the picture? into the picture, sorry. We'll discuss that insha'Allah ta'ala. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. So the first challenge of Imam al-Kadhim alayhi salam was in the very beginning when Imam al-Kadhim alayhi salam took on the responsibilities of Imamah. Listen to what happened. As you know, at the time of Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam had a little bit more freedom and he was able to preach the teachings of Ahlul Bayt He established the first Islamic university in Medina. He established the first Islamic university in Medina. The reason being, the reason why he was given some freedom was because at that time the Abbasids and the Umayyads were clashing, which took away some of the, um, which took away the, the, uh, the focus of the Umayyads from Imam al-Sadiq And ultimately the Umayyads fell at the hands of the Abbasids. When the Abbasids became the Khulafa, what happened was they gave some freedom to Ahlul Bayt or at the very least, at the very least, in the very, very, very beginning, um, they stood up and called for the rights of Ahlul Bayt, for the rights of the family of the Prophet And because they used that slogan, they in one way or another had um, gave some sort of leeway in the very beginning to Ahlul Bayt Obviously, obviously, after some time, a short period of time, that was totally taken away and the Abbasids were worse on Ahlul Bayt than the Umayyads themselves, according to what history tells us. And that could be debatable. Regardless, Imam al-Sadiq had a little bit more freedom than the rest of Ahlul Bayt and so his influence was not just focused on the Shias, rather, on many people and of many different groups and sects. What happened was Imam al-Sadiq had a big family, had many sons. The three most prominent sons of Imam al-Kadhim of Imam al-Sadiq sorry, were number one, Imam al-Kadhim. Number two, a man by the name of Abdullah al-Aftah. And I'll tell you about him in a bit. And number three, the eldest son of Imam al-Sadiq by the name, name of Ismail. The name of Ismail. The Shias knew that Imam al-Sadiq had some time left in his life. And they started to ask between themselves and they started to inquire who the next Imam is going to be. Ismail was a very, very, very good man. He was very religious. He was knowledgeable. And when people looked at him, they felt that he held the qualities of Imamah. And not just this, he was the eldest son of Imam al-Sadiq So many people thought, and it was widespread, that he was going to be the next Imam. As for Abdullah al-Aftah, Abdullah al-Aftah, according to some hadith, um, he wasn't the best man. Now, on this there's debate as to whether he was covering from, for Imam al-Kadhim or not. Regardless of that, in al-Kafi, you find a hadith that allude to the idea that Abdullah al-Aftah wasn't the best of people. And it is said he was named al-Aftah because he had some sort of deficiency, he had some sort of physical ailment, 
whether it was he had uh, an ailment in his feet that made them extremely flat, or he had some sort of flatness in his head. He had some sort of physical, I would say, some sort of physical marking that wasn't uh, some sort of physical abnormality, let's call it. So he was known for that abnormality that he had. And I believe, I believe some of the ulama say that he had a very flat head. Um, regardless, regardless, he was known for that quality. As for Imam Al-Kadhim alayhi salam, as for Imam Al-Kadhim alayhi salam, he is Imam Al-Kadhim alayhi salam and there's not much more to say. But these three individuals come, come into play very, very much after the death of Imam Al-Sadiq alayhi salam. What happened? It is said when Imam Al-Sadiq alayhi salam was still alive, many people thought that the next Imam was going to be Ismail. Ismail being the eldest, Ismail holding the qualities that he held. All of the sudden, before the death of Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, Ismail passes away. The Shias, they're confused. What's going on? Isn't he the next Imam? Isn't he going to be the one to take over after Ajafar al-Sadiq alayhi salam? How did he pass away before the death of al-Sadiq? Here, the Shias began... The Shias were confused. They began to question, what's going on? What's going to happen? It is said Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, during the procession or the ceremony, um, getting uh, Ismail ready for his burial, he would go to the coffin of Ismail and look at him and make sure and tell the people he is dead. He has passed away. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took his wadi'ah, took his amanat. He would make sure with the people and tell them, my son Ismail has passed. After the death of Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, that's where the confusion happened. And that's where the clash occurred. One side, and I'm sure this idea was circulating even before the death of Imam Sadiq, but after the death of Imam Sadiq, it became prominent. One side said Ismail was the Imam. And he did not die on that day. Rather, he is the Mahdi. And he will come back, or from his lineage is Al-Mahdi. And he will come back. He went into occultation. He did not die. And this is where the Ismaili sect branched off from Shia Islam. So you had some go through, or sort of branch off with that group, and it still lives on until today. We have Ismailis up until today. And it branched off from Imam al-Sadiq where they thought that Ismail was the next Imam. Although Ismail was a great man. Ismail was Shi'i, he believed in the Imam of Imam al-Sadiq and I would be surprised if he did not know that Al-Kadhim was the Imam. He surely did know. This was the Ismaili sect, Jamil. Then we had the Afatiha. Who are they? They were those that called for the Imam of Abdullah al-Aftah. They were those that believed that Abdullah al-Aftah was the next Imam. Why? Because according to some of the rawayat, Abdullah al-Aftah was claiming such a thing. He was claiming that I am the Imam. Now there is debate as to whether Abdullah al-Aftah was doing so to actually bring the people to him as in he actually believed that he was the Imam. And according to the ahadith, a person that does such a thing is a kafir. Other ulama come and debate and say no. No, he was trying to take away the Abbasid government from Imam al kadhim He was trying to save Imam al kadhim alayhi salam from the Abbasid government. He was trying to take the focus off of Imam al kadhim alayhi salam and so protecting the Imam alayhi salam Allah. So some of the Shias went to Abdullah al-Aftah and now there was confusion. In some of the ahadiths in Al-Kafi, we find that some of the prominent Shias, some of the prominent Shias were confused as to who the next Imam was going to be. To the degree, to the degree that it is said, some of the companions came into the city one day, into Medina, and they were looking for the next Imam. They didn't know who the next Imam was. There was confusion. They went to Abdullah al-Aftah. They sat with him. And I'm summarizing the hadith. They, they sat with Abdullah al-Aftah. They asked him some questions about zakat or khums or charity, some, some sort of Islamic tax. And he gave them the wrong answer. So they got up and left and they knew that this was not the Imam. For sure this was not the Imam. He gave us the wrong answer. We know the answer. We were testing this man. When they left, they were confused. What do we do? What is it that we're going to do now? 
all of a sudden it is said one of the companions sees a slave or a man in the distance and that man starts to call that one companion to him who did they think it was they thought it was one of the spies of the Abbas al-Khalifa al-Mansur so one companion says to the other he says go with him and if you don't return you're a shaheed and in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inshallah we will be forgiven we honestly don't know who the next imam is going to be if you do come back good if you don't come back if al-mansur takes you and kills you then our ha- our issue and your issues is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that one companion goes the servant takes that companion to the door of al-kazim alayhi salam Goes, that companion goes inside and sits with Imam al kazim alayhi salam. Imam al kazim alayhi salam looks at him and he says, Ilayya ilay, to me, to me, not to this group, and not to this group, to me, I am your Imam. Before the man says anything, before the companion says anything to Imam al kazim alayhi salam, the Imam says to him, to me, to me, not to them, and not to them, I am your Imam. It was a miracle. That itself was the proof that this companion needed that Imam al kazim alayhi salam was the Khalifa. And as you know, my brothers and sisters, we say that the Imam alayhi salam proves his Imamah through number one, an nas The Imam before him comes forward and says, Imam al kazim is the Imam after me, an nas The second way is al hujja al hujja a miracle that the Imam alayhi salam does, a proof that he presents to the person who's asking. And a third way is al and wa shawahid different signs, different signs that will point to the Imam alayhi salam Allah. The Imam, Imam al kazim alayhi salam, proves his Imamate through this miracle. This companion then leaves and tells the other companion and then the news spreads. As you can see, there was a lot of confusion at that time, my brothers and sisters. But there were some companions that were advanced, some companions that held knowledge that others may not have had, or or they understood the way that the Imam alayhi salam, Imam Sadiq thought, they tapped into the mind of Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. What do I mean by tapped into the mind of Imam Sadiq? Let me tell you. Hadith says this. One companion comes to another prominent companion of Imam Sadiq alayhi salamullah. One of the ulama that Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, the students of Imam Sadiq, the scholars of the age. He comes to him and he says, did you hear the news? That companion says, no. What's the news? He says, he says, Imam Sadiq alayhi salam wrote in his will, that the Imam after me are five. Imam Sadiq wrote in his will, the Imam after me are five people. Who? Number one, Al Mansur al Dawaniqi, the Abbas al Khalifa. Number two, Muhammad ibn Sulaiman, who was the right hand man of Mansur al Dawaniqi. Number three, Abdullah al Aftah. Number four, Musa al Kazim alayhi salam. And number five, my slave. And he named the slave, I believe. Or he said, my servant, my slave. The companion that was listening, he says, it's al Kazim. Musa al Kazim is the next Imam. The companion, he said, what are you talking about? The Imam said five. And you're telling me it's al Kazim. How was that the case? The companion knew what the Imam was saying, knew what the Imam was thinking, and tapped into the mind of the Imam. He said, number one, Al-Mansur al-Dawaniqi is an oppressor. He is someone sitting in the chair of Ahl al-Bayt with no permission. The chair, the government, the Khilafah is for As-Sadiq salam And As-Sadiq was the first adversary for Al Mansur al Dawaniqi. Now he's giving him the Khilafa. How? Number one. The Khilafa is not going, the Imam is not going to go to an oppressor. Number one. Number two. The right hand man of Al Mansur al Dawaniqi is no different than Al Mansur. 
Number three, Abdullah al-Aftah has a deficiency. Abdullah al-Aftah has an ailment of some sort. He is not complete. And the Imam must be complete from every single perspective, from a physical perspective as well as an intellectual perspective. He has to be psychologically sound and physically sound. Why? Why? Because number one, number one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's hujjah is going to be perfect in every sense so that the people can come to him and be drawn to him and not in any way, shape and form leave him or not be drawn to him. He has to have that magnetism. Number one. Number two, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the ability to provide you with a perfect imam. Why would he provide you with an imam that has an imperfection? Wisdom dictates that your imam, that your leader has charisma, has the ability to draw the masses and not allow even one person, one person to not be drawn and to feel I don't, I don't know, I don't, they, to feel that this person doesn't draw me in, I feel like his ailment, his, the way he looks is not appealing. So that there's no hujjah, there's no proof that this person can give Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment and say, this person's face, the way he looked, the way he sat, some, the, the way he was physically just didn't draw me in. And I did not feel comfortable sitting with him. The Imam must be perfect. Abdullah al-Aftah has this ailment, has this deficiency. And not just that he has the deficiency, he's known for the deficiency. His nickname was the one with a flat head, with a flat feet. He was known, and I believe some say the, a, flat, um, a flat chest, I believe, is, uh, I believe as well. Regardless, his name, his name was because of the deficiency that he had. And it's not Abdullah al-Aftah, Jamil. What about the slave? He said, the Imam has to be a free man. The Imam, the Imam is not going to have a master. Rather, he's the master of everyone. Rather, he's the master of everyone. And according to some of, I believe the ulama, or if it's a hadith, it's a famous line. Ihtiyajun nasi ilay. Ihtiyajun nasi ilay. إلى الإمام وعدم احتياجه إلى الناس دليل أنه إمام البشر دليل أنه إمام الناس The fact that everyone needs him and that he needs no one means he is the master of everyone means that he is the Imam for everyone He, could not, he cannot be a slave, he cannot be a servant, he cannot himself have a master if he has a master, then how is he the master of his own master? It's a contradiction. So that companion, he taps into the minds of the mind of the Imam, Imam al Sadiq, and out of the four, he finds the true Imam. The other companion, he's he's bewildered. Subhanallah! Look how the Imam protected the identity of Imam al Kazim alayhi salam, and ultimately led the Shi'as led the Shi'as to knowing who the rightful Imam was and Abdullah al-Aftah and the others were taken out of the equation with one, with one flawless statement from Imam al-Sadiq On this, there's a hadith from Al-Kafi. It reads as such. Look at this hadith. An Abi Ayyub al-Nahwi قال بعث إلي أبو جعفر المنصور في جوف الليل فأتيته فدخلت عليه وهو جالس على كرسي وبين يديه شمعة وفي يده كتاب. This rawi, this narrator, he says, I was called on or I was called on behalf or by uh, Abu Jafar al-Mansur, al-Mansur al-Dawaniqi, the Khalifa. One night I was called by him. I entered his court or I entered his room, his office, and I saw him sitting with a shamaa, with a candle, and he was reading a letter. And look at the deception. Look at the deception of the Abbas al Khulafa. Look at this. قال فلما سلمت عليه رمى بالكتاب إليه وهو يبكي. When I came in and I said I said my salams, he took the letter that was in his hand and he threw it to me and he was crying. فقال لي هذا كتاب محمد ابن سليمان يخبرنا أن جعفر ابن محمد قد مات. 
This is the letter of Muhammad ibn Sulaiman, the right hand man of Imam al-Kadhim telling us that al-Kadhim has passed away. فَإِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ He says, إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ three times. And then he says, وَأَيْنَ مِثْلُ جَعْفَر And who's going to be like Ja'far? This is Al-Mansur al-Dawaniqi, the killer of Ja'far, crying apparently in the middle of the night, saying, إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ Who's going to be like Ja'far? ثُمَّ قَالَ لِي أُكْتُبْ قَالْ فَكَتَبْتُ صَدْرَ الْكِتَابِ so Al-Mansur tells this narrator who says, write. So the narrator says, I began to write. ثم قال, اكتب إن كان أوصى إلى رجل واحد بعينه فقدمه واضرب عنقه. He says, write in this letter. If Jafar gave the Khilafah or gave the Imamah to one person, specifically one individual, then take this person and cut his head off and behead him. قال فرجع إليه الجواب أنه قد أوصى إلى خمسة. He says after some time a letter came back to Al Mansur al Dawaniqi from who? From Muhammad ibn Sulaiman, from his right hand man. A letter came back from Muhammad ibn Sulaiman saying. That Al-Sadiq gave his wasiyah, his will to five. Who are they? وَأَحَدُهُمْ أَبُوْ جَعْفَرِ الْمَنْصُورِ One of them, one of those five is Abu Ja'far al-Mansur. وَمُحَمَّدِ بِنْ سُلَيْمَانِ وَمُحَمَّدِ بِنْ سُلَيْمَانِ The second was Muhammad ibn Sulaiman himself. وَعَبْدُ اللَّهِ عَبْدُ اللَّهِ الْأَفْطَحِ وَمُوسَى الْكَاظِمْ وَحَمِيدَ In this risala, in this in this riwayah, it says Hamida, the wife of Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, was also given the wasiyah, the, the imamate was given to Hamida as well. We know that Imams of Ahl al-Bayt alayhi salam from Ahadith Rasulullah are all men. No degradation, no devaluing of our fellow sisters. Not that our sisters are not worth such a place or they don't have this, the ability to reach the highest of levels, but in the very, from the very beginning it is said, the hujja of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the proof of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the 12 imams are all men. These are the qualifications of the imam alayhi salamullah. That companion was able to see that from the very beginning. And so Imam al-Kadhim alayhi salam took on the reins of imam. Took on the reins of imam. Then a hadith surfaces. Hadith surfaces. What's the hadith? The hadith was from Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. Look what he says. And this hadith was analyzed by Shaykh al-Mufid, was analyzed by Alam al-Majlisi. Look what it says. It says, it says from Imam Sadiq, مَا بَدَى لِلَّهِ فِي أَمْرٍ كَمَا بَدَى فِي إِبْنِ إِسْمَعِيلِ أَوْ فِي إِسْمَعِيلِ إِبْنِ There was no bida that happened from Allah. Or there was no bidat that happened relative to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as it was done or as it happened to my son Ismail. When we go and we analyze this word bidat, bada, the word bada means dhahara. What's dhahara mean? Those Arabic speakers. Dhahara means to show itself, to show, to uncover. Dhahara, jameel. If we take the word bada, and we put dhahara instead. In other words, if we were to take the word bada and replace it with dhahara, what does the meaning of the hadith show or apparently look like? There was nothing that showed itself clearer to God as the issue of imamate pertaining to Ismail showed itself. In other words, in other words, at first thought, when you read the hadith, first glance looks like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't know, apparently, from the Imam from Imam as sadiqs words, Allah ta'ala didn't know that the Imam after as sadiq was going to be al kadhim It's as if Imam as sadiq is telling us, it showed itself to God that Ismail was not the Imam and that al kadhim was going to be the Imam. 
And this is the concept of bida, my brothers and sisters. And on this, our fellow Sunni brothers and sisters, they tried their best to say that the Shias believe that the Imams know more than Allah or that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gains knowledge as he goes. So as if he's, this is just like a trial for God and he's learning as he goes. Like me when I'm trying to drive or when you or anybody's just trying to, trying to get going, trying to understand what it is that they're, they're just going. It's just happening. Impulsively making decisions left and right and then, oh, that was what the reality was. Okay, we'll learn and next time we'll go. It's as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't know what was going on. And this is the idea of bidat, my brothers and sisters. An idea, a concept that was looked into and dwelled into and discussed deeply by the Shias. And it has, pertains to not only an ideological issue, and it doesn't only pertain to aqaid beliefs, but it also pertains to nahu, Arabic grammar. For us to understand what the Imam was trying to say in the hadith, we have to analyze it linguistically. The scholars, they came forward and said, that the Imam alayhi salam was not saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gained knowledge or figured things out when they happen, as they were occurring. No, the word bada lillah does not mean it showed itself to God. Rather, rather, Allah showed the reality to others, to the people. Allah ta'ala made the people think that the situation was in such a manner that the situation was unfolding in such a way that Ismail was going to be the Imam after a Sadiq. But then all of the sudden, Ismail passes away, Allah Ta'ala takes back Ismail, all for a wisdom to tell the people that the Imamah is not in your hands. Imamah is not even in the hands of the Imam before him. Rather, it is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as we know, as we know, the actions of the Imam are the actions of God. They're inseparable. But we as human beings separate between the Imam's actions and the actions or the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or else they're one thing. They're not separate. Regardless, regardless. Allah ta'ala performed bidat or not performed bidat. I would say made bidat occur to the people for a wisdom.